thank Andrea and um, Bob and Anne and Sterling for what they exemplify, which is integration, partnership, leadership, to really get what I think our friends at Citibank said so beautifully on the, uh, on the uh, film this morning to make, and, and I love this phrase, I wrote it down, universal, inclusive, and scalable what we do in this integration. And that's why CFED's leadership has been really instrumental in the work that we're doing at Imagine the U.S. Department of Education. And uh, frankly, you know, Sterling, when you introduced me, I, I thought to myself, it's the ideas that come from CFED, from the thought leadership in all of you that represents somewhere around 1,200 people across the country in every state but one, and I have to find out what that one state is and see if they have a gear up program <laughs> and see if they can help us execute some part of this vision that we hope will make a difference uh, to really make a universal reality for every family in this country. And I always underscore this, especially those with the least economic means. I mean, that is really a principle that every day we talk about. Um, and it, so in addition to the ideas we bring people into the federal government now from all venues. And I just want to mention David Sue over there. Just raise your hand, David. David uh, is, has just received his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. I feel, you know, I'm the grandmother of the Department of Education. Even Arnie Duncan is younger than I am. Um, and so it's wonderful to have uh, the research capability in the, in the Department of Education to help us understand what do we know, what is the evidence, and how can we be very practical in applying that evidence to really reach every family, especially, as I said, those with the least economic means. So this morning, we're gonna hear from the experts. We're gonna hear from students, people, who have benefited from the concept, the philosophy, and the pragmatics of savings accounts. And so I'm really delighted to be able to, in a few minutes, introduce them. But first, I just want to give you a perspective that we're following in the Department of Education, what we've done and what we plan to do. Savings for college, if you pick up the newspaper, every, pretty much every day in my readings, you read about college affordability. And you saw President Obama talk about cutting in half the increase in college tuition above the cost today, which is becoming more and more unaffordable, cutting that excess in half over the next decade. And so we are driving, you know, on the one hand, building assets for people. But on the other hand, we have to look at the systems we have. And of course, I oversee post-secondary education, so I look at that as a system and a very complex system and in some ways, in some parts, a disconnected system, and you see a part of it with tuition rising, and you say, how are we going to match those children in kindergarten that you saw in the, you know, in the, in the film with opportunity in the next, uh, gosh, 15, 14, 13 years when they go through the K-12 system after they graduated from uh, the kinder caminata, which is the, the kindergarten graduation. So, you know, for me, coming into this office um, right after when I joined um, the administration in July of 2009, President Obama, my, my first week I was able to go to uh, Michigan, to an automotive plant in Michigan, talk with people that had been laid off, uh, people that had been on the assembly line for many, many years, all of a sudden found themselves unemployed, trying to figure out could they ladder into uh, a better job, transfer into a comparable job, what was going to happen to them because they faced unemployment. And for too many, they weren't ready to even transfer into another job. The automotive plant I visited was becoming a robotics plant. You needed to have a computer science background. You needed to have a post-secondary degree or a certificate. It could be an entry-level training. 
but too many of these individuals, and frankly, when I talk to my colleague in the department, Brenda Dan Messier, we have today 47% of American adults who can't read at the high school level. So while well, all the good things, that's many more than we had 15 year, 50 years ago, but today when you talk about learning and economic capability and the future of the country, we've got to do a much better job than we did in the last 50 years. So right after taking office, President Obama set what we call the North Star. Uh, he set a 2020 goal that by 2020, the US would once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. And that means two year and four year. And for us it means, and the President also said this early on, that every American should aspire to at least have one year of post-secondary training or education. So we've been about that work over the last three years, and we've done a lot of things to hopefully move us in a much better direction than we've been in. So we just saw, you know, for, for my first couple years, we were 16th in the world when we compared to, uh, you know, ourselves to other developed countries. We just moved up to 14th in the world. We want to be number one in the world. Doesn't mean other countries can't be number one also. Talk about integration and partnership. But we have lost our share of thought leadership and intellectual capacity over the last 50 years that we need to get back. Um, so our ranking is unacceptable. And you know, when I talk about our North Star and Arnie Duncan, our secretary uh, who's on Education Nation this week, you know, talks about the North Star as being college and career ready for every student who enters, and I would say from zero to you know, 16, 17, 18 years of age when they go on to the next phase of their lives being college and career ready. So it's a goal, it's a shining goal, and we want every one of the students here and all of us to have a North Star so that we can create what we call a 21st century America that is really going to be prosperous and inclusive and that we can scale what's working in this country, learn from the evidence, and move forward. So to make college more affordable, you know, the first couple years we focused on grants and loans. So, you know, today 60 million Americans have had a Pell Grant to go to college, and you couple that with the GI Bill, and you get a better educated society over the last 50 years. And actually, I must give a shout out to uh, Senator Claiborne Pell. We're ce celebrating this year the 40th anniversary of the Pell Grant <clears throat> that resulted in those 60 million uh, folks getting, yeah, getting educated. So when I, when I came to the department, you know, I looked at the numbers of college going and who's enrolled in higher education, and we had six million low-income students with a Pell Grant enrolled in college. So what's happened in the last couple of years, we're now almost 10 million. So just in a couple of years, we've gone from six million to you know, almost 10 million. We've had a you 60% know, increase. And what's even more interesting, if you look at the evidence, we have increased by 100% students in college from families earning $10,000 or less. So that's the kind of strategic thinking that we need from all of you to get to the outcomes like this and hopefully double that in the next few years. And that's what's going to create the momentum to reach what the president wants us to do, uh, the 2020 goal. So it's pretty ambitious. And what we're doing is really looking at what's working in the country. Can we, can we support that? Can we shine a spotlight on it? Can we scale it? Can we replicate it first and then scale it? And so we've got different funding streams that we're trying to use to get to this. You're all familiar with Race to the Top. That's one way we are looking at states who will provide some leadership to raise academic standards and you know, turn around the lowest performing schools in the country. We've got 5,000 of those on a list where they're getting an infusion of support and networks and you know, building on Jeffrey Canada's work and others to really figure out where can we populate around the country what I call islands of excellence and make those islands really universal. Um, and so you know, when, when I go back to what the president is saying and why, you know, why I need to think about this pretty much every day, um, he says you know, there's no better economic policy than one that produces more graduates. And we, we mean graduates so that you know, a third of children will be ready. You know, we have two thirds of children ready for kindergarten. Talk about early learning. We need to have that other third ready for kindergarten. 
So that graduation that you saw in the film is just you know, one example of moving to the next level. We have too many kids not on grade level. We lose 25% uh, of high school students. Uh, they don't graduate in some parts of the country over 50%. So when you look at all the strife around the world, you think you know an undereducated society is not going to be what this democracy needs to be the kind of democracy that Sterling talked about. And we've got to keep college affordable to do all of this. And so we've done things like income-based repayment and public service loan forgiveness. So anybody who wants a teaching job in a public school or a government job or wants to be a police officer or a fireman will now pay mo no more than 10% of their, um, um, of their um, income after, after taxes to be put toward managing any debt that they have to assume. But frankly, you know, our agenda wants you know, as little or no debt as possible, especially for the families that I talked about in the beginning. So how can we craft a tuition policy and a loan and grant policy um, and learn from other countries and learn from the asset building that CFED is doing to figure out how to make all this come together so that, you know, I was thinking back when, when you all were talking and introducing me um, that I, at one point when I was uh, president of De Anza College, I graduated a father, a son, and a grandfather in the same graduating class. And to me, you know, that's kind of like the inter intergenerational challenge that, you know, the son had come over from, from Vietnam right after the war, no money, no nothing, was a refugee, got a Pell Grant, you know, made a successful small business, had a son, 10 years later had enough money, bring the father over, you know, and I'm thinking, hmm, the transfer of wealth in that little family, you know, could educate that son's children. And so I think the thinking that you're doing in terms of this intergenerational pipeline and the fact that, you know, in the next decade, the transfer of wealth in this country will be, un, you know, never seen before. It's gonna be the biggest transfer of wealth in this country well, let's make sure that every, everyone can participate. So for our little part of it, and I'll just close and, and bring the students up here in just a minute. Um, in 2010, our secretary joined the chairman of the FDIC and the National Credit Union Administration and committed to the concept of college savings accounts. And so, you know, we've seen the evidence that it works. We know it works. And so we just launched <coughs> taking um, $8.7 million dollars through our national gear up program, and I have to give a shout out to all the people who are helping us in, in every state in the country look at college going strategies, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. So we have launched the Gear Up College Savings Account Research Demonstration Project, and we're gonna do a randomized control study. It's gonna be the largest public sector program to see how can we get low income high school students ready to and into college with savings accounts. So we're gonna give savings accounts to 10,000 ninth graders. We have $8.7 million to start it up. Um, and we're going to really study that evidence, to create a pathway so that we can then go backwards and go down to the levels that you know, Sterling has talked about. So every one of these students is gonna get $200 to kick off the savings account. Um, they'll have a statewide account that each of the Gear Up grantees is going to open. I shouldn't say that's not totally definite because every time we try to do something and the government always takes time and we have received a lot of feedback from you as, as early as this morning to say, well, how can municipal governments play in this and so on. So we have to listen to all the feedback, you know, publish the comments, publish the responses and then publish the rules. So that will happen pretty quickly because this is a high priority. We want to grow the savings accounts to about $1,200. Couple that with a Pell Grant, which is you know, $5,500. Couple that with state scholarships, you know, the promise that you heard about other states are doing this kind of thing, so that we, these students will have the opportunity to go and will know it's in their future. It is going to be a North Star. We'll have another control group for the randomized control study and be, you know, be on our way. So with that, let me stop here and tell you, you know, I could be here all day telling you about what we're doing and what we're planning, um, but I think the most important work, as I said, are the ideas that CFED and each of you have in figuring this out in a very systemic and strategic way to get every family, especially those most in need, the opportunity to not only be ready for kindergarten, 
but to go through every single grade on grade level, not drop out. I mean, I have to sort of give kudos to Mayor Nutter over in Philadelphia. You know, they've got a regional plan. Nobody drops out. Really, really hard in Philadelphia. But he's got the community integrated, working together toward that end, and that's what we need in every city and every town.